I have good news and bad news. Which do you want first? Bad news. Bad news. Jesus doesn't love you as, as an individual. <laughs> I'm sorry. The good news is God loves you very much just in big groups. That's sort of our thesis for today. I want to propose to you a different idea that God thinks in groups. So you and I have often been sold a version or an understanding of the gospel or of the story of God's redemptive love for creation. But in a very enlightened, western, white version where you are a special you, and which is true, you're a very special snowflake and God loves you very much. So I don't want you to think that. But I just want you to see that God's concern is much bigger than just getting one little part of you into a heaven after you die. Okay? So I'm going to ask you to just set aside whatever you came in with this morning, uh, and you can pick that up. In a minute, we're going to be in conversation groups, and you can say, I don't like this at all, and that's fine. But I just want you to put it aside for one second and consider this. That in just those three passages that Katie read for us this morning, you see that God's concern is for very large groups, nations, generations, peoples, languages, tribes. God thinks in groups, and you see it over and over again in Scripture, unless you have been taught to think about it differently. So one of the things we do is sometimes when we come to Scripture with like a, a, a conception, a preconceived notion, we just read sort of quickly until we get to the part that sounds familiar or that we like, and then we slow down and read that part, right? But we like fast forward over the other things, and sometimes we don't even notice until it's pointed out that if you actually take time to read the Christian Scriptures, you will be amazed that God thinks in groups, and this is a huge transformation. So I can confidently say to you this morning, Jesus loves you. But not as an individual. In your group. And this is a completely different way of thinking. My thinking on this started about 15 years ago when um, you know, I took the Bible very literally back then. And it, so it always puzzled me a little bit that there were verses in Scripture that said things like, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You're familiar with passages like this? And so me, being the little me that I was, I tried really hard to take up my salvation very seriously. Well, here's where it got a little complicated for me, is that when I would meet with God during my morning devotions or during a worship service or you know, whatever it was in, uh, in small groups and one-on-one -on -one conversation, I felt the presence of God's love so deeply I felt so accepted by God. I knew that I was adopted into God's family, that I was one of God's children, because God's spirit, according to scripture, testified in my spirit that I belonged to God and had been adopted into God's family. So I couldn't quite figure out how I was supposed to work that out in fear and trembling, since I wasn't afraid of God, but that I knew that Abba, the Father, loved me and us deeply. I didn't know exactly what we were supposed to be afraid and trembling from. So I asked somebody who sort of knew these things. And this person, who was more familiar with the original language than I was, that the Bible is written in Greek, said, oh, so here's the problem is, in the Greek, it's not you, Bo, it's y'all. Because in the original Greek, it's not a singular, it's a plural you that we don't have in English. I said, what? Is that real? So I looked into it. Turns out, it's really real. That we are supposed to work out our salvation in fear and trembling. That's kind of different, right? So it's not me being really focused and really diligent and really pious, which I was never really good at anyway. I'm not very pious. I may look like it, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Instead of me being really sincere and taking this thing really seriously and trying to muster up this this fear of God and, you know, a sinless God and my dirty rags and right. But then also try and reconcile with the fact that I am forgiven and accepted and approved and redeemed and beloved of the Father. That we are God's children, that God is the grandmother of us all. How was I reconciling these things? And then I started meeting people from different cultures. So not only did I have an understanding of the original language that I may not have been um, taught to read it correctly, but then I started meeting people who come from different cultures, and this really transformed my understanding of what self is. One of my favorite stories is I was in class with a guy who was from a culture in Asia where you, when you say your name, you have to say three things. One is the area, the region that you're from, then is your family name, and then is your name. And I just thought, well, that's really interesting. So I asked him about it, and he said something that like forever changed me. He said, unless I say where I'm from and who the family that I was born into, there is no me without them. I was like, what? Because I actually know some people who like have changed their name, right? Because they, they want to update their identity or right and how that whole thing works. And the more I started thinking about it, you know, Jesus, I don't know if some of you may not know this. Uh, Jesus's last name wasn't Christ. <laughs> I, some of you, that's that's actually not his last name. Uh, his last name would have actually been the son of Joseph. So it would have been Yeshua bar Joseph. And I have a friend who's from a Nordic country where your last name is your dad's name plus son, right? So Jacob Wayne's son and Wayne Norm's son, right? And how that is passed down. And so when you start interacting with people from different cultures, you start to understand, huh, I really don't think about this maybe in the healthiest way. And maybe I can learn from people from other cultures, especially when their culture is more similar to Jesus's culture. Then maybe I can start to understand why Jesus said some of the things he said. It really caused me to think this through. And so while I can say, yes, Jesus loves you, Kelly, obviously, everyone loves you. So I can say (laughs) Jesus loves you. But that's not actually the truest thing I can say. The truest thing I can say is Jesus loves y'all. Whatever your group is, your we, God loves you all. That's the truer thing to be said. But in order to get people to hear it, I have to say something really sort of ornery and somewhat not true, which is that Jesus doesn't love you as an individual. Jesus loves you in groups. This is a profound Difference, And so one of the conversations I want to have in a minute when we break up into smaller groups is, who's your we? When you say we, who do you mean? This is one of my favorite questions in the world. When you say we, who do you mean? So for instance, when I say we, I most often mean people who were raised evangelical or conservative or charismatic, but have changed their conviction or or persuasion on this. So I'm a post-evangelical. When I say we, that's sort of what I mean. When I picture my my tribe, if you will. But some of you may mean um, cancer survivors or mothers or immigrants or LGBT community. Who is your we? And then we have to ask the second question, in what way does God love us? Because God loves you as a group. It changes the way we proclaim the gospel because the gospel is not about you praying one prayer so that one part of you goes to heaven after you die. That's such a small gospel. So here's how I define the gospel. The gospel is the good news that God loves the whole world. And in Christ, did something for us we cannot do for ourselves. Good news! 
That's the gospel. The Evangelion. That's it. That frees me up to say, if that's the good news, then what is salvation? So salvation isn't getting one part of you, your soul, into heaven after you die. Salvation becomes living into the promises and the ways of God together in a way that brings about human flourishing. So if your friend asks you, are you saved? Now you can tell them, I'm getting there. (laughs) Instead of, shut up, I hate that question. (laughs) Because I know some of you really hate that question. You've you've told me on multiple occasions. It rubs you the wrong way. And it should rub you the wrong way because it's the wrong question. If God thinks in groups, then the gospel isn't just about you. It's about eternity. It's global. It's cosmic in its scope. You get caught up into its current. God loves you. All of you. Right? It's a totally different way of talking about God's work in the world. And then salvation becomes not an insurance policy so that you don't go to the bad place, right? It's not fire insurance for after you die. It becomes about life, it becomes about life before death. Are we participating in life and faith together in a way that brings out the greatness of what God has created us to be? and lends itself to human flourishing across the board. Because here's the good news. God loves us. God loves us all. And it feels amazing to be able to say that. You matter, not just because you're a special you, but because of the role you play in the bigger we. We matter to God. Every one of us. Together, It's a completely different way of understanding. Thank you for letting me run this new idea past you. I'm going to look forward to a second when we work it out together in our smaller groups. But I'd like to ask, just seated where you are, if you will sing this song with me as we prepare to celebrate together in a little bit at the table. Will you sing with me?